Whoops, something happened here. Hi, Hi Roman. Roman. Yay. Hi. How are you guys doing? Hi, audience. Good, good. Something happened with the with the intro, but that's okay. I didn't mean it. Yeah, well, because we brought Roman into the show. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Hello. Kathy. I'm 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 glad to be back on track. And Roman, today I think is your show, right? Again, it's your show, no? No, no, it's 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 your show today. And hey, everybody, how do you like my uh, my purple hair? I thought this was my screen. I like that hair. No, that that's actually my color hair now. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Is it yeah. like a political expression? No, no. Is it a Actually, no, it's a it's a little bit of a of a blue tint in the background. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I did the so, same mistake. I said, Oh, yeah. It's uh, the light from the window making yeah. your hair. Yeah, well, I, I'm enjoying my new studio, and I wanted to say that we were starting the uh, New Mexico Cares live show. It was going to be starting tomorrow, but we have a bunch of guests that are coming on the show, and I have to, I have to clarify with them what we're going to talk about and I decided you know rather than do it piecemeal I'm going to do a nice big show we've got people from Africa from from uh, China from uh, different parts of the United States that are coming on that know the whole backstory about what went on with uh, with uh, what went on, what happened before Bark House and then what happened after Bark House so that's going to be what my show will be about and uh, either one of you are welcome to join and and if you want to, um, it's probably going to be the uh, the second week of October that we'll launch it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what's our topic today? How dogs communicate? I I have something to share. Okay. I hope I'll be able to do that, and that should and an, an answer the question. Uh, let's see if it's the appropriate picture. Yes. Okay. Woof. Okay. Dogs teaching dogs, right? Right. Yeah. Roman, what is your take on that? Um, well, for the last several million Weeks. years of evolution, um, definitely other animals teaching their offspring how to do things and how to survive. And whoever didn't do that didn't survive telling us about it <laughs> so i think l the learning process observing others doing things or learning it yourself are two options to learn things so the best way is to observe others and be safe and observe how they do it so you're not making the mistakes or see how they perform better um, so now the science is already behind that start proving it that if if your dog observes you how you do things he wants to do it too so if we see people digging in the yard and making the beautiful gardens and then a dog follows them doing exactly the same thing yeah that's what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah, did, did, did you ever did you ever see that video of the great dane where the guy is walking and and, and he he's going down on his almost on his knees he's doing lunges and then the dog follows right behind him i think we showed it once before but i don't think we can because it's a copyright uh, video right. but it, it was very very cute so um, is that what you're talking is, about yeah i i show my dogs how to do certain things by doing it first no, I'm not peeing on trees to show them how to do that. Okay, <laughs> But, for example, if I want my dog to go on a scale, so I'm stepping on the scale first, showing him what I'm doing. So I knee on the scales like a dog would sit and stay. I'm not moving. Then I'm getting up. I'm doing another couple of times. And then I tap on the scale and let him do that. And well, my what, dog, a great, what a great way to train. Yeah, you, you just show the dog what to do. And the dog would mimic you. Exactly. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. That's my brother. Hi. Yeah. Hi, brother. Okay. Now, that's a slippery slope because if you get upset about your kids and you're yelling at your kids, stop running around. Go back to your bed. And then the dog sees the kids running and then he barks at your kids. Where do you uh, think he's coming from? Right? Yeah. And I've seen many times people freaking out about the dog's behavior. And then you ask a couple of questions and you say, well, you showed your dog what to do. <laughs> Monkey see, monkey do. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Yeah. 
So the humans are the problem again. <laughs> right? Isn't, it, isn't uh, that the we, case for sure? I think yeah. we should just be more aware how we affect our environment and, and how our emotions and our actions affect our environment and just be more conscious of it. Yeah. Okay. And that's important. How we feel and be honest and authentic towards our dog is as important as teaching a dog obedience, which I don't like the term because a dog doesn't have to be obedient. What we expect from obedience is the dog actually showing his emotions. A dog uh -huh. sits because he's calm. A dog lays down because he feels safe being calm. A dog sleeping, meaning is not, there's no problem anywhere. I'm good to sleep. So if I send my dog to his bed and force him to go there, I'm forcing an emotion onto the dog and I cannot force an emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my brother says he pees on fire hydrants to teach the dog. Don't let the fire department look at you because then somebody else would do something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, Ron, thank you for the uh, comment. <laughs> thank and you for the bad and, advice. And, th and thank you for the visual too, Ron. I can well, just imagine, yeah. We need, a, we need a proof of that. So now, please, now Ron, I know why the yeah, we, we need to validate that, Ron. So we need a photo. Uh, we need a photo, <laughs> if not a video. Otherwise, yeah. now we're questioning your statement. Yeah. Right, Is this yeah. the reason some hydrants are yellow? Could be, yeah. <laughs> I bet Wrong. it really is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Roman, I, I uh, this morning I posted, and it was about uh, how we don't pay attention to our dogs, how they're always with us every time something is going on in our life. They're actually with us all the time, and I don't think we recognize and acknowledge that they're there. You know, when we're ill... I think that's the only time that we realize that they're they're Velcro to us. They want to make certain that we're feeling good. They can sense it's a natural instinct. I wish we, I wish we all had that natural instinct to be able to identify when somebody else is in pain. But they're with us all the time. So how do we're communicating with them, but more on a on a on an energy level, because it's not done by words. So how does that happen? Well. Dogs have different way of communicating. First of all, they they are in alignment and in, in, in tune in the situation. And we do pick up emotions. So dogs pick emotions and they're in tune with the partners they're with. So as soon as they build an attachment relationship with their partners, whoever that is, then there is already a communication established. It's kind of like you and your partner going shopping and then your partner stops and looks at the screen and you know why he looks at the screen. And then the things are just, you just know things, right? A child comes home from school and the mother says, hey, honey, what's up? And the child says, nothing. Mom knows there is something going on mm -hmm. because she's paying attention to all these details. So a dog does the same thing. When... When we are getting into a, a communication level and a different way of, of stages of communication, and it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a skill. It's not something you are born with, right? So dogs naturally are learned to observe environmental movements and then associate it with what's going to happen. So they have these consequences, and this is why it's very important in puppies to grow up with their parents and their siblings because they learn from these interactions what each action means. Right. And so the first stage that we say in communication is the me stage with the dog, everything he needs to communicate towards his environment, his needs. I am hungry. I am thirsty. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to eat. I need comfort. I need nurturing. And so the first in, the first style of communication a dog learns is to express his emotions, what he needs. And the mother or his parents or his siblings are already in tune and expect that information to come in so they can adjust their movements. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So if the dog doesn't show these expressions, then he will not have his needs met. So the dog naturally will go through different, uh, a different repertoire that comes in naturally to get his message across, and then he will remember which one worked. Okay? Like if I scratch on the table, I get food. If I jump on the counter, I get my food. If I paw you or I push you and nose you, then I get a petting. And the dog learns from it, right? But then 
at some level, the dog needs to learn that you may eventually have also something to communicate. So we then we go to the want stage where the dog express the way he wants things to happen and there is a consequence to that. Well, if you don't do this, you don't get what I have. And then we have a two-way stage communication where the dog is sending the message out and expect the feedback, not the consequence. So he can adjust accordingly to what's going to happen. And then we have a conversation stage, which is very advanced, and not many dogs can do that, where you guys can communicate over distance and make decisions over distance without actually exchanging anything else other than intentions. So the difference is you're sitting on a, a, a bench and suddenly you turn your head backwards and you see somebody staring at you. How did that happen? Yeah, just feel there's, it. There's something coming in predatory towards you and you feel victimized and you turn your head and look at this person like, is there everything okay, sir? Okay. So that was, for example, a conversation stage that comes in non-verbal and non-physical. And just people are not aware of that. So if you are afraid, it's because somebody sends an, 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 an aggressive intention into the environment, like a predatory intention. So, mm -hmm. if, and I didn't know existed that. I was watching a couple of years back a, a movie at National Geographic, which I know, you know, people says, yeah, you know, everything is staged. This particular one was a, was a continuous sequence of a lion being very low and observing some gazelles. And at some point, all the gazelles stopped moving and everyone ran off except of one animal. And it, it didn't click to me yet. But later, a couple of years later, when I was fishing, uh, I, do, I did spare fishing, like free diving. And I was just not really hunting for fish. I was just observing fish. But I recognized if I would go into a mood to go hunt fish, I would not see fish at the same spot, the same day, similar hour. But if we would go outside and drop my stuff and go back in and go with intentions to hunt, even if I don't have tools, then fish will not show up. But if I go with my tools and my gear and pretend I'm scared, I got all these fish coming up to me. So even the fish really? sense this kind of energy. And I know some, some fish have this yellow line on the side. They can feel vibration and frequency. And I feel a predator has a different type of frequency versus a person who is scared. It's mm -hmm. kind of like hearing a sound coming in, you know, like, and so that change of frequency could be a reason why some animals are more perceptive to predators than others. So I saw this with dogs too. When, when we're working with dogs and you put intentions, oh, let me, let me, let me tell you what to do. The dog is more resistant of following through other than offering. So the dog makes a distinction between you offering or you wanting things to happen. That makes sense. That that makes real sense. It, it, it's almost like treating the the animal, treating the dog like like a human. You would offer to a human. You don't tell humans what to yeah, do, and you if don't you do, say, they back up. Right, go sit sit on your table, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, or say, yeah. You're welcome. Who, have, who have are you to tell me what to do? Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. And unfortunately, it happens all the time with people who work with dogs um, that they come in with such a controlling means, like, hey, take that treat because I offer you the treat, and your dog is like, whoa, dude, I, I don't know you. Why would I do that? What what, what do you want me to do? You're not respecting me. Why I respect you? You're not sensing how I feel. Why should I follow with your stuff? So if we don't establish a, a, a relationship, a health relationship, the dog has no need to do anything that we want. Right. No matter. Right. And, and this idea of being the alpha, it doesn't make any sense anyway, because the alpha is the parent. So you cannot be the alpha of your dog unless you have like, ew. I can't even think of that. But anyway, <laughs> um, a, a parent is the parent, and there's a relationship, a parent-offspring relationship. That's the alpha pair. And they have established relationship. They have established communication. What the mother says to her child is not the same that you tell to your dog. Okay. Okay. And well, then what, why, do, why do they call it <coughs> alpha? 
Why, it's, why it's, do you hear trainers a, and, and everybody in the industry call it alpha? It's a false statement. Really? It's a false statement. And the one who actually invented that term, Dr. May, who was um, hired for the Department of Agriculture to study wolves in captivity, he said, I'm sorry, I did wrong. But by the time he said that, all these books were on the market and he has no control of those books. Oh, really? He did a That's whole video saying, hey, you know, guys, you got it wrong. It's my fault. I said it wrong because yeah. I judged wolves in captivity behaving like wolves in nature, but it's not the case. Yeah. Of Thank you for joining us, Abby. We got Abby with us. She's a, um, a spiritual medium and animal communicator. Thank you very much, Abby. She good, says, good. I totally agree and work the same way. I have no expectation of animals. They live with me in a relaxed and happy way. Respect is earned and returned. Earned and right. respect. That's good. Earned and returned. Yeah, like that. What, what happens here, and Abby pointed out very nicely, is even if you do a healing session to an animal and was like, oh, this is so nice. You can invade the dog's personal energy field by invading the dog. If I do an energy on, the, on an animal or a dog without his consent, I'm violating his space. Uh -huh. So it's very important. If I, if I do energy work on animals, I always check in consent. Are you willing to work with me? Do you want to work with me? And energetically, the dog can want or not want to, uh, to come into that space. Uh -huh. So we have to always get consent. And in the conversation, great point, you have to have consent entering a space of a dog just because you are the person and the dog lives in that house doesn't mean you have the right to enter if your dog feels that you shouldn't enter yeah yeah i have a question i have this mysterious question about um mother dog teaching her daughter sign language and this came from a speech therapist who relayed to me that her service dog for session with children with speech impairment was using sign language. That's the mother. When the mother got puppies, she kept one puppy with the mother. It's happened to be a female, a daughter, a daughter. And then the therapist realized a few months later that the daughter was reacting to sign language without being in any session with the therapist and the child and the mother dog. So there is a power of communication there that it's above my understanding and beyond my understanding. And it's mysterious to me. Well, um, I know as a fact, and it's it's my conclusion, I'm not saying it's scientific evidence, it's difficult to make that scientific evidence. However, it's studied a lot, but not in public. Um, these are, you know, government programs. Um, I know of, of children who are nonverbal and have the power to make things happen, like lighting something on fire or moving things telepathically. They can send you an image and those who I think are very advanced communicators, I have an easy time communicating with animals, but they have a hard time communicating with people because they believe we, we, we numb them down to speaking. Speaking is such a poor communication skill. If I can send you an image of how I feel and you feel the same way as I do, it would be a perfect thing. If I tell you imaginary about the place that I love being, and you feel the same way I feel, and you are in that place that I am in that mindset. Well, this is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. so, can you communicate with a dog if you are telepathic skilled? Yes, but doesn't mean the dog understands and expects that language to happen and may confuse what image is getting. Because the image the dog gets, if you send him the image, it depends on how the dog observes things. If I send him a car as an image, the dog may see that car as a threat because he was brought to the car to a veterinarian, for example. Make sense? So from mm -hmm. that perspective, we should 
stop and listen and get the images. So I have a dog here is basically sending me an image that he needs to go to the bathroom. I get the image of I need to go out. And then I add the rest of it. So that is very important. We, st we have to start listening. And I, f I feel actually not, not a compliment. If somebody says I am a dog whisperer, I don't like that term. I like the term listener. I like to listen to dogs and just picking up on stuff. It's more important than just talking to dogs. Always be open to establish uh, um, a communication skills and waiting. What type of information do I get? But you have to be open to it. And and that's, I think, what we have to do. Yep. Uh, you did not really answer my question, but you opened a page about telepathy and nonverbal communication and intuition. And this is a dimension which is very much under the radar in our society. Uh, we disregard intuition, we disregard feeling or, you know, telepathic communication as, oh, it's a coincidence or, oh, no, I didn't, well, it's happened twins, once. And... Twins are not coincidence. If mm -hmm. one twin feels the same way than the other twin over distance, there is no coincidence. That a twin married the same type of person that never met before. The twins are being separated after birth and they have yeah. the same lifestyle, the same job and the same partner. Similar. Yes. Yeah. Is this coincidence? Come on, give me a break. Yeah. yeah. There was there an are no coincidences. Right. There's an anecdote uh, in that regard. Two twins separate at birth, uh, given for adoption in separate part of the country, reconnect about 30 some years later. Guess what? They were all firemen. <laughs> really? Yes. True story. They were firemen. They never talked to each other. They've never been in contact with each other for 30 some years. And they turned out to be firemen, both of them. Wow. And wow. Uh, so they, they, there's thing in the world that our society and our culture disregard and previous culture take took into consideration. Um, and it, it's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of missing a third of our life when we put aside the, I would say the esoteric part of our existence to be very broad terms, um, very vague and broad, broad terms, which is not physical, not verbal communication, not intellectual communication, but this third dimension which is touching the spiritual dimension of the human being is greatly, greatly uh, discarded in our right. life, in yes. our society. It and is. That, that's a little bit, that's more than sad because a third of our capacity is uh, turned off or right. turned down. And if we have an intention and we put an intention out there and energy is attached to it, then we can bring that to us. We can manifest it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm totally into that. You know, speaking of that, think about, for instance, a dog that gets lost or is, um, let's th take the, the movie with Lassie. How did Lassie get home? Lassie she was well out. trained. <laughs> well, no, seriously. Uh, how, how did they? How, how did Lassie find a way to get home? And you hear about dogs finding their way home. Do you think possibly it's that the people that had lost Lassie were thinking their intention was there, and the energy was there, and they were guiding uh, Lassie home to a certain extent? I, 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 I believe in that. I really do. Um, so, I wouldn't generalize that concept, but true some dogs have special abilities mm -hmm. um i would kind of like a wonder child kind of thing like a wonder dog who has more abilities when when i work with dogs i see basically three categories teacher healers companion as, as a quality of of spiritual qualities and i see there are some teachers coming and live with people who have these amazing abilities and we just don't let them reach that level and we see dogs who know that you're coming to the shelter. They are not good dogs until you show up and then they're perfect dogs. Yeah. 
Yeah, right? that's true. Um, yeah. I know dogs who, who go into fire and, and bring out their partners that are not even the same species. And we see, for example, a dolphin go and help a person in need. Uh -huh. And these people have no relationship. The person just fell off the boat and yep. protect him from sharks. Like, mm -hmm. we have to just be open. And I think if you look further back um, in, in ancient times, and I saw many people think Lemurians and, and Atlanteans are kind of a myth. Well, okay. Um, it seems like we had better communication skills back then, even if we screwed up over the time. But it seems we, we knew better and we were more connected to nature and we were more aware about the energy fields and everything but it seemed for some reason we have erased ourselves from that so we not making the same mess again and here we are again doing the same thing all over again just differently yeah. but i think we should just listen start listening more we're we're talking too much we just want to control too much instead mm -hmm. of stepping back a little bit i think the native americans have this amazing skills to be one with nature and you never knew there was somebody passed by here because they were in alignment with it mm -hmm. Yeah, Abby says, when you work at finding lost or stolen dogs in animal communication, it is incredible that they can send information as to where they are. Yeah, see, I totally believe that. Totally <laughs> believe that, Abby, that, yeah. Yeah, and we bring them home. We help to bring them home. Yeah. To, you know, a lot of that, like the power of prayer and things like that, you know, when energies unite, we, we, can, uh, we can make things happen. Sometimes I tell people, sometimes you have to be open for the miracle that you created by manifesting it. You can manifest things. Dogs can manifest things. I, I have examples for a dog reaching out through a fence to a thing that was too far away for anything to reach out. And yet it was in his crate. How did that happen? Like uh -huh. what magic hand went there? Like wh which long tongue went out of the can grab that and pull it back in? It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, Abby says uh, not every animal wishes to be found or reunited, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Abby. Especially because some some of them run away deliberately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you ever wonder why that is, Roman? And Gaetan, why do why do animals run away when they have it so good at their home? Well, we we have to see it from a more dog perspective. Okay. What we consider a pet is not a healthy place. And here's mm. why. And I know it will backlash on me, but this is the reality. We have about nine hundred million dogs out there. The majority of them are free. Nine hundred million? 900 millions plus. What? Now, it's, wow. it's kind of like for a dog to be free and do whatever he needs to do because he feels good about doing that. He's just fine. But we're coming from a perspective that because we want to share that freedom and that, that pleasant reason for a dog, we just put him in a box. So it wasn't like that a couple of like 100 years ago because dogs lived in a neighborhood and were everybody's dogs. It was kind of like the, the, the village dog who took mm -hmm. your kids to school and the dog came back again, protect your property from other intruders and, and strange people. It was just everyone's dog. In India, the, 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 um, the dogs in India, the uh, streety dogs, or mm -hmm. the dogs in Egypt, or the dogs in Bali, all these dogs are village dogs. They're just there for everyone. And they're, they're not owned by anyone, but they are cared by everyone. That's right. the life of a dog. Now, mm -hmm. put the dog in because I love dogs. Put them in a house and contain them and put them in all this restriction. He doesn't have free food. He doesn't have free water unless he drinks from a toilet bowl, right? Or he doesn't have free access to outdoors. It's really putting the dog down to his minimal of his necessary needs. And the dog, why would he stick there? Why are you not walking off and doing his own thing? So we have to see that aspect. And my approach is I want to help people in this unfortunate, very contained environment to make the best out of the dogs and give them the maximum freedom possible. Because, of course, I cannot have a dog roaming free in, in downtown through New York City or something, right? It's because our social settings are not right anymore for the dogs. They're not safe anymore. Uh -huh. And so we have to make at least the best out of it. 
But just because I have a dog, the dog has to feel good because I love the dog. That's not the right thing to, to think. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so am I against pets? No, it would be ridiculous because I have pets too. But the mindset, it's still, my concept is I have a house dog. Mm -hmm. He's still a dog. I'm not changing what he is. I'm not making him a pet. I'm making him a dog. Uh-huh. Yeah. This uh, yes, Very, okay. This is a, a, a another key point uh, in your approach to dog and dog with relationship with human. You don't put the dog as a pet, and the pet is very close in terms of word as object and object of pleasure. Yes, and when you use the word house dog, it's more inclusive. It's more part of a, a broader entity or broader community or broader life experience than saying, this is my pet. This is my object. It has four legs, it's move, it's bark, it's poop, uh, it's do all kind of thing, but it's my pet. And yeah, this there, is, there's a certain amount of ownership that that happens. Yeah, right, right. right. And with ownership, you have the, the factor of domination. Right, right. Uh, the, it's a very common experience to have somebody expressing his domination on his dog. And having well, a dog. Where the, term, where the term pet comes from, it comes from 1849. And it, it, so it was a derogatory meaning of a teacher having a preference over a person. Right. And wow. we see that weird relationship already right there, because there is a need for a teacher. There is a, there is a looking up of a person towards a teacher and then a teacher takes advantage of it and has mm -hmm. him as a pet. Right. And that's back in 1849. And now we have two, 20, 21. I think we should kind of grow out of it a little bit. <laughs> that's a very, um, it's a, it, it, it's require a change of mind. A oh yeah, uh, a change of mind frame reference, because it's related to how we see things around us, and pet is one of the things we see around us. Is how we see children around us, and how we see other living beings around us, or other humans around us, and sometimes the behavior with the dog as a dog owner is very close to the behavior they have with other people. It's I, would, my... I, would ask, I, I agree with you. I agree with you totally. That's Sorry, it. I, I interrupted you. I had to have a delay here. No, no, that's okay. I just, you know, I just, I just looked up the definition of, of pet. And as a noun, it says a domestic or tamed animal kept for companionship or pleasure. As an adjective, it says denoting a thing that one d devotes special attention to or feels particularly strongly about. And then the third, which would be a verb, is I'm going to pet an animal. Mm -hmm. So so there's different ways of looking at the word pet. Uh, well, we can look at it from either way we want. <laughs> yeah. It's not alone. Right. right. <laughs> it's a tool, yeah. a credit tool. Um, the reality is that in 1928, um, people wanted to sell things. In you know these difficult times, everybody tries to sell things. Like now we're selling water in the bottle because our water is not good enough to be water. Back then, <laughs> we were selling pets. Pets are pets. Do dogs or animals as pets. So the yeah. pet store was invented in 1928. Before that, there was no pet shop. Before that, there was no pet dog. Really? Right. Interesting. Very interesting. And so coming from as a pet comes in from a previous explanation in the 1800s that a pet is the something that I want to keep for myself for my own pleasure without really caring about the other one side. Yeah. And then we say somebody who sells a pet to another person, how, how does that sit in? Like, let's let's change the words my wife and i have a happy family my wife just gave birth to two pets 
<laughs> so if it doesn't sound good to you, then yeah. think about why you're calling your dog a pet. Uh -huh. What oh, rights boy. come with it, right? I'm sorry. I just... says, what no, no, the, it's a yeah, it's a very strong image, and you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Ab Abby concurs with that. She says, what a wonderful program this is for me. I have always despised the word pet. Many animals are my family. And that's true. It, 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 you know, I created a graphic once. I'm, I'm a digital artist. And I created a graphic of, you know, how you get the sonogram of the um, uh, for the baby? Well, I put a dog in there. <laughs> and, and it was... So, so I'm going to look that up and we'll show that on next week's show. Yeah, because it, it was kind of funny. I understand people saying, ah, you're humanizing dogs. How dare you? Hold on a second. Yeah. What are humans and what right. are animals? We're both mammals on right. the same family. We totally, have yes. children and we grow children. We educate children. We love our children. We care about our children. We would give our life for our children. And now let's look at dogs. Dogs have offsprings. They love their offspring. They protect their offspring with their lives. They would kill for it. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the difference between those two? Because they have four more legs and we think we're smarter. I don't think a person can survive more than a week. Yeah, the I think they have only two more legs right? than human. Only two more legs. You said yeah, four more, more legs. legs. That would be yeah, six. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was, like, <laughs> I was thinking of my three-legged one. <laughs> But um, oh. at the same time, we have to see that why are we saying that dogs are the man's best friend? And I don't, I'm not a sexist here, okay? Why are dogs people's best friend? Because it seems over those at least 4.2 million generations of dogs living with people, they have so much things in common. We have a closer relationship in the way we function in our family than apes do. Uh-huh. How, how is that possible? So we cannot ignore that fact. Mm -hmm. We cannot just look away because of convenience. Yes, if I feel lonely and I want a pet, then I have to consider why do I feel lonely? It is my problem. It's not the dog's problem. Mm -hmm. Like just because I feel lonely, I'm not making a child. Just because I'm lonely, I'm not getting married. We have to kind of become aware of our inner needs and not and not using an animal to cover those, it, it will backfire in one yep. way or the other. If we want to evolve emotionally and spiritually, we have to become aware of our needs and how we cover them. Mm -hmm. And it this reflects to our children, reflects to our dogs. And you know, Roman, there's to add on to that, which I think is is really important, is dogs have a um, they are actually better friends than humans in most cases because they don't lie, they they can't tell a lie, they're they're always loyal to you, they don't backstab you, they don't tell secrets, they they don't think they don't live in the past, they don't live in the future, they live in the moment. They are perfect examples, perfect models for all of us as humans. So I think we should be able to learn from them in in many cases, which is part of what the dog connection originally started out to be. Yeah. Uh, they've got that that inner ability, the instinct to be able to determine danger danger and fear and, and they, they instinctively want to protect and take care of us. Isn't that a lesson for all of us? That's how I see it. That's my true sense. I, I totally me, agree with you. Me too. I, okay, Kathy, when you asked me to be on the show, I went like... Mm. Right, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, right. I'm not sure about that. And then when you send me that video, I make the connection. Based on what you just said, both of you, if human can learn one thing from any animals, is to live in the present. You don't have anxiety, you are not, you're not anguish, and you're not stressed by what happened in the past or what will happen in the future. If you just, if we can learn just to live in the present moment, in our interaction with other people, especially, uh our life will change yes how much yep. trouble we have because oh 
Oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm not sure about what's going on to happen. I'm not sure about this tomorrow. You, you call somebody and you say, uh, I'm doing a party next Saturday. Are you interested? And the person reply, well, I don't know what I'm doing next Saturday. Uh, did I invite you for a party or what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Conclusion. Kathy, uh, Roman, who, who, who want to close the, the show today first? I'll close the show. Well, Roman too, but. Roman, okay. yeah, okay. Uh, I'd be it, just kicked out here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I didn't mean that. Your, Roman, your word of wisdom before we we leave. leave. Oh, don't, don't, don't pull me that color on. Um, oh, good, 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 I, good, I feel, good, good, good. I feel we should open our hearts and and let our higher self come in and explain to us nicely without being frustrated why we have dogs in our lives. There is an agreement. I'm not saying contract. There is an agreement that we call in animals to help us through this ascension process, to walk us and remember things that we have to work on. So we invite those animals to come into our home and we should treat them like somebody we have an arrangement with to help us through the process. And at the same time, we, we arranged with them and we didn't agree with it. We arranged it that we help them too. So while dogs going through an evolutionary process in, in their emotions, they learn from us how we manage emotions because I think the only big difference of us is how we manage our emotions. Mm -hmm. And dogs help us work on that. At the same time, dogs learn from it. So they can learn how we master our emotions because we really suck on it, actually. Even though we have this ability, we're not using it correctly. Mm -hmm. And dogs are here to remind us, showing us, hey, you have trauma. This is how it feels to me the way you behave. So I'm mirroring it back to you so you can see how it affects me. And we take that as a reason to punish a dog instead of learning from it that your actions actually trigger the dog. Or your dog is here to help you, recognizing that, hey, I have the same problem you have. I have been mm -hmm. through the same core trauma you have been. Why do you feel we both attract each other? Because you feel pity? Because I have the same feelings that you have. So yep. we should give that dog, open up this potential of that relationship. And not dump it down to our level of, hey, I need my dog. Now I don't need my dog. Now put him in a shelf. Right. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Kathy? Uh, well, where I want to go to add on to what Roman just said is I think maybe we should all reevaluate why we even have a dog in our life. If it isn't for the purpose of being able to share companionship and have them as part of the family, then maybe you shouldn't really have a dog in your life because they were given to us as a gift. I truly believe they've been given to us as a gift, as a way for all of us to learn and expand. And if what Roman has been saying is if we can learn to communicate with them on a level, uh, on any level, if we're able to communicate with them, I think we will all be so much better off. But know why you have a dog. Evaluate that. Mm -hmm. That's my last word. Thank you so much. And uh, we have Abby saying thank you so much for everyone to uh, for the show. Thank you for watching. Uh, we have a very steady audience today. The number Good. didn't fluctuate. And uh, this is a very important topic we cover. Yes. And we start by communication and we start by questioning what, and we finish by questioning why we have a dog. What's the relationship with a dog? I don't have a dog. And based on, this is, this is my approach. Based on everything I, I has been said today, I don't have a dog because I don't know how I can make his life better. Where I am now, I cannot have, a, I choose not to have a dog because I will not be able to make the life of the dog comfortable. Okay. It will be too restricted and too limited with the space I have. So if one day things change, I have a bigger space and I can make this dog or a dog coming in and I have a comfort and, you know, safety and security and freedom of movement, 
then I will consider a dog at that point. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank, everyone. Thank you. One last yes, thing. I just wanted yes. to, to say how, how important. No, keep, keep him on the big screen. This guy here. Right? Um, I want to say how important your contribution is. Even if you don't have a dog, you still do a, a big thing. Many people out there did more for children and didn't have children themselves. Uh -huh. So you don't have a dog, but the way you make your movies and the way you show animals is the way of you contributing. Now, because let's say you, you, have you a can dog. feel it, you feel it, yeah. Gaetan. Okay. Let's say you yeah. have a dog and you have two dogs because you love dogs and you have a cat. Okay, other people who says he has a lot of pets then you would not have time to do all those things. How would you mm -hmm. go for a trip if you have to pay attention to your dog or to your cat? Yeah, It restricts you. So some people are, are here to make this um, shift, this paradigm shift. And even though they don't have dogs and don't have cats and don't have animals, they still be able to make that shift mm -hmm. better than somebody who would have an animal. Doesn't mean That's they're right. less because they don't have. Right. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm speechless. So thank you. Uh, you can bark about it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Abby says that was a completely unselfish reason. And yes, it is, Gaetan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, I don't want to make uh, okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see. Let's put it that way. Everybody, thank you. Okay. And, Bye, everyone. Namaste, everyone. We'll see each other next time for sure. Okay. Okay. See you next week. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.